Welcome to Art Talk with April. I'm April Harris of Inked April and the host of this podcast. This is season four. We have some amazing artists on. I can't wait to share them with you. So let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art Talk with April. This is season four, and I'm so excited to introduce you guys to Ansley Moon Smithy, who is an artist and educator and a pastor, right? Yes. <laughs> and so, um, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for Thank you. this. Um, so let's just get right into it. Like, how did you, so you're born and you begin to love art. When, when did that happen? <laughs> well, this is fun. I cannot believe I still have this. And it's like a super awkward school picture, but I have this star. Oh, I can't yeah. read it very well because of the lighting. But on the star, it says, I want to be an artist. Aww. So in <laughs> second grade, I guess I, I knew I wanted to be an artist. But I was a very shy child. No one believes me now, but I was a very shy, quiet kid. Yeah. And I would draw and read books all the time. So that was just what I love to do. Anytime I could draw something, I did. I also really wanted a horse so much that I told my dad when I was 16 that he could get me a horse instead of a car. But we didn't have farmland <laughs> or anywhere to put a horse. So I would just draw them and I would make them look as real as I possibly could. And then I have an, an uncle. He's so sweet and humble about it, but he makes lovely landscape paintings and he's done some portrait paintings of my cousins and he would help me I would bring my sketchbook and he would oh. give me drawing tips so oh, he really cool. inspired me you know to have somebody in the family that's making art and doing it um consistently and you can see their art hanging on the walls of family houses also my mother really inspired me as well she mm -hmm. um was an art teacher she was a preschool well let's go back she was an interior decorator or designer she yeah. was an interior designer and then she was a preschool director and then she, she started teaching art and she's also very humble about it but she would make amazing set designs for the school musicals and really amazing now she does these cakes that I don't know if you've seen the show you've got is it cake on yes Netflix? but I think my mother could go on there and win some money they're really amazing illusion oh, cakes. awesome yeah she and a caterer friend make them but she does the visual part so anyway and anything she or my grandmother would touch just they could make it beautiful and design it beautifully so that really inspired me too Oh, oh, that's so awesome. I mean, there's so much there that you had all of these people around who were very creative and, you know, brought yeah. all of these different things to the table. And I love that you brought up Is It Cake? Because my kids are obsessed with that show. I do not yeah, know why, but they, they, my son in particular, he will watch it back to back and he'll watch the seasons over and over again. <laughs> Yeah, and we'll try to guess which one is the cake. <laughs> I'm like, I don't okay. think I'll be able to convince my mother to go on there, but I've seen a lot of it's a it's a cake lately. So I get what you're talking about. And it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so then you've you grew up and you had all of these artistic influences around, and um it's oh gosh, I can't imagine that's just so fun. And then yeah, were you like creating anything in particular it was mostly horses or were you like leaning toward anything or it was a lot of it was a lot of horses and then I really loved I remember we would make these I don't know if kids these days do this but we would have something yearly where there was kind of a, a you'd read a book and then instead of doing like a book report, you'd get those cardboard partitions. Oh, yeah. You yeah. would, you know, design a, something to go with the book. And I remember doing one. I was really into uh, the gloomy, like angsty British literature. So I'm like the rainier it was and the sadder everyone was on the moor. <laughs> I would I think it was maybe Jane Eyre or something. I would. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I made this thing with like an old manor house and roses everywhere. Oh. And, so, and it was very expressive and detailed. And so I loved that. So I think I was leaning a lot towards realism, but more of what you would probably call like the magical realism. 
Mm, yeah. So where it didn't just feel like I was copying something, but there was this kind of uh, magical, imaginative story-like aspect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. love that. That's fun. I feel like, you know, whatever you're kind of leaning towards in your younger years, it can kind of give you a lot of information about what your true, like maybe what your style is or what you're interested in you know that kind of yeah. thing just well like I found it. the older I get the more I circle back in my art yeah because I mean so you've gone to college for art right I and did I got my BFA at the University of Mississippi hotty toddy and then I got <laughs> my MFA at the University of Alabama so roll tide yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I can say them both because I got, yeah. I got my I got a degree from each. So. Oh, it's awesome! And then you were you taught I want to say at a college. You did. Some- I did. My first job was at Marion Military Academy. Oh wow! Okay, at a military school teaching art appreciation. And then I I got married and moved to Huntsville. Applied to teach at. UAH. So I taught at UAH for about 10 years. And then I started teaching. This will be my third year over at Holy Spirit Regional Catholic School. So I switched from the college kids to pre-K through eighth grade kids. Wow. Oh my gosh. Pre-K through eighth. That's yes. That's quite a variety. It's a wild ride. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm never bored. I can say that. I'm never oh, bored yeah. at work. I guess so. Oh, my goodness. I just want to delve into that a little bit as you're, you know, you have this unique experience as a as a teacher. And are you, I guess, going to the different, are you going to the different classrooms? And No, they, they came they to me. To I was adamant about wanting yeah. a classroom. And they, they offered that in the first place. I will say... Holy Spirit, just to brag on where I work for a minute, they are so supportive of the arts, not just the principal, but the the teachers enjoy having it. And the parents have been wonderful. Anytime I've asked for donations, you know, they've shown up or asked to have people come and help out in the art room. They show up and yeah, so they come to the art room and it's a really fun room, if I say so myself. And um <laughs> All the ages get to come through. Um, We arrange it where the the middle schoolers get a little bit more time, but pre-K all the way through eighth grade get to come in. And the the budget is for the materials is great and it's celebrated. And yeah, I'm very, very lucky to have what I have there as support. Yeah, that's unique, I would say. Yeah. It's sadly unique, you know, that yeah. you're at a school that is really excited about that. And yeah. And I think they value it for the education, not just like, oh, they get to go play because play is important. But I think they also value the way that it is teaching their minds to think for the middle school. It's in the stream rotation. So I'm proud that they don't just do STEM. STEM is great, but the, they also put that that art in there and the reading and all those things working together um, to help the kids think in ways that will benefit them and benefit society, we hope. So, absolutely. Oh, man, I can't tell you how many times I've thought that myself was like art has so many important elements, I think, just for all humans, you know? Yeah. To- well, we talk about like with um, with painting, for example, we think painting and math are are completely different. But if you think about color theory and ratios and color temperature, they're absolutely related because what you're really doing is visual math. Like if red is a strong color, then you have to cut down the amount you mix in with something like a yellow because you're thinking about color temperature, you're thinking about value. And all that is thinking about amounts and what are amounts? They're math. They're, you know, an amount is math. So you're, you're, it's visual math. So we talk about things like that or like creativity, like even even if you're something like a lawyer, which we go, are lawyers creative? And it's like, they're absolutely creative because if you're arguing with someone else in a courtroom and you want to win that argument, you, 
you've got to, you know, do it legally, of course, but you might have to get creative in, you know, your verbiage and how you present something to a judge. So like even the things that you think aren't a creative job because there's not paint splatters everywhere (laughs) are absolutely creative. Or like I've given them the example of like a doctor, if you have a patient and they have a chronic illness that's just, they've been to all these other doctors and nothing's worked. Well, you might have to think about maybe you know, some treatments or combining treatments in a different way. Well, any th- anytime you're trying to come up with unique logic, that's creativity. So, yeah, yeah exactly. Everything that we could possibly think of doing involves creativity. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, one of the things that really resonated with me is, um, you know, like I taught, I taught art for like a minute. <laughs> I was like, I taught art for one year in a junior high. But one of the things that I always noticed was like that being confident enough to start and to keep going. And when you get up to a problem, like you're like this, I don't like this. And then to keep going after that, to solve the problem, to, you know, just keep trying and to actually get to the end and finish. That in itself is something that I think we all use like day in and day out is just like being okay with making a mistake. Absolutely. Well, and that's the bottom line, too. I think the value of art and education is, you know, a lot of things we do are so standardized. And sometimes I think that's actually really dangerous to their thinking that that's how we test them because they get out in the world and the world's not standardized (laughs) and problem solving is not standardized and people's behavior for sure is not standardized. And so, you know, they leave the state, the safety of all that standardization and then they get out in the world and something like paint that's messy, like you can't standardize how those art materials are going to work and sometimes you have to start over and sometimes you make a great piece but it wasn't what you intended and I think that again you can apply that to any situation and art is sometimes the only space they have during a school day to get comfortable with that you know so they really I think it's extremely necessary Yeah, yeah, I do too. I think it's like life lessons. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) You're not going to do, you know, be an artist or designer or whatever. It it it's applicable everywhere, you know. I think it teaches them not to quit things even when they get hard. Oh, and that's so can't have a more valuable lesson than that. (laughs) Yeah, that's that is that's a wonderful lesson. And it's one of those things that I think, you know, it's all about being mature and emotionally mature and being able to handle problems and different things and, you know, kind of be adaptable and resilient just in yeah. life, you know. But um, so I wanted to get on to your your medium and your voice and what you do. Um, where where. Where do we go with that? Like, are you, so I know that you love your oil painting, but I you do. also do all of these other amazing things. So tell me all about it. <laughs> well, t- yes, yes. Okay. So when I, when I chose to change my major over to painting, originally it was journalism, actually. So, <laughs> so it was still an art. It was writing, yeah, yeah. And speaking to people. But um, I just fell in love just head over heels with oil painting. Art was my minor at the time. And fortunately, I had a teacher. My main fear naturally was, how do you make money? How, how do you make it a real job? Because although I had all this amaz- amazing encouragement around me as a kid, All the artists I knew were doing it as a hobby, as a side thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I had not seen anybody be a full-time artist um, or at least have it as like the consistent core of what they did. Um, So I just didn't really think that was a a possibility. (laughs) And even though I had all these great art influences around me, I grew up in a really, really small town and we didn't have a big art museum. We had a very tiny library, which I love that library. Um, But, you know, if I wanted to see art really in the books there was was all I had at the time or thought I had, 
you know, I look back and I'm like, well, a lot of these people, creative people probably have like a studio in their garage like me. And I just had no idea, you know, Um, but anyway, (laughs) that was where I could go see art. And so, you know, I didn't know like you could have a job as a curator or that you could um, have a job in some large museums. The docents are paid, you know, that's a paid job and not, not volunteer. Um, I didn't realize you could kind of have a big studio operation or um, like make money doing commissions. I didn't realize until um, I went to school that commissions were actually a thing and there was, was a way to like make them into a business or um, or residencies. You know, I had no idea about any of these things. So, but at first I just knew I loved oil painting and I had this teacher and the way he phrased it to me as I went, well, you know, what if I starve? And he went, well, you know what I did when I wanted to be a painter? I did all this research and I brought it to my father and I said, hey, this artist makes, you know, $3 million a year. And, and my argument was I could make nothing, but then I could also make $3 million. And his dad was like, all right, we'll give it a try. And um, <laughs> my professor, you know, I do not think was making $3 million. Professors <laughs> don't make that. I know because I've been on that on that yeah. ladder line. They don't make $3 million. Um, but he was obviously, he had a, a wife and lovely kids and a family and, um, you know, obviously was not starving and yeah, yeah. had an artist community and was very happy and successful and did shows in the little galleries in Oxford, Mississippi. So I went, huh, well, looks like I can, that looks pretty good to me, you know, yeah. and $3 million was never really my goal anyway. I'm like, it'd be nice, but I don't know yeah. what to do with it all. I don't think so anybody thought, well, that, would put that it down. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, that looks like a nice life to me, an art life, if you will. And so I just went, well, that's my new goal is not $3 million or fame, but to live an art life, to make that a lifelong sustainable practice. So that was such a gift to see that all around me. And if you've never been to Oxford, Mississippi, go, it's one of those places that actually reminds me of Huntsville a little bit um, in that there's a lot of art going on and, you know, bookstores and like places, you know, local restaurants. And it's really supportive of of local creativity and being able to sustain Mm -hmm. that. Um, So that was kind of my like second gift of seeing that all around me and someone going. And also this professor went, kind of pulled me aside and went, you know, out of the, out of the blue went, Hey, you know, I think you could do this. So that's something I learned whenever I see a student now that I think they can do it. And I tell students, it's not that you're talented or you're not. I think what makes the difference is the love for it. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, just that love for it, plus the discipline. And I think that's what he saw in me. So when I see a student with love and discipline for art, I always make sure I pull them aside and go, hey, I think you can do this. Because having that whispered in your ear. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. So I just knew I loved oil painting. um, And I had wonderful training in that, mostly realism based. He was very much a believer and you need the technical technical base before you start breaking all the rules. Um, And so as a teacher, I do that to this day as well. I'm like, I love all forms of art and all styles, but like you need to know color mixing and how to apply value um, and good design, um, how to arrange a picture. I think those things are really important. So I kind of gathered all that there. And then as I taught, I I made sure I was keeping up my studio practice. Now, the reason my mediums switch around so much, I'm coming to that. um, I had children. (laughs) So when I got to Huntsville, I immediately went in low mill and I said, I found my people. And uh, Marcia Freeland, that, that is the director there, she's amazing. And what they do is amazing. So yeah. I was there for a couple of years before I had any kids. And um, I was up on the third floor, which is the best floor for oil painters. The light is fantastic, the big windows. Nice. So I would make lots of small oil paintings, still lives. Um, I explored uh, in grad school, I had started making these like paper paintings and done this installation where I painted directly on the gallery wall. So, and they were kind of abstract shapes. So I did a little series where I kind of uh, made these illusions of painted paper looking mm-hmm. like they were coming off the surface, but they were all in oil. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But then I kind of found myself always being drawn back to 
observational painting and kind of um, the lighting and the color. And um, I, I found that I work best when I work quickly. Um, I've done paintings where I go really slowly and I build up glazes and I just find that I get really tight when I do that. And so I really love like the Alla Prima painting where you're directly painting and you're pushing that paint around. Uh Um, I found that that process, something comes out when I paint that way that doesn't come out when I slow down and and tighten up. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was doing those sorts of paintings and then commission work, mostly portraiture Mm -hmm. with the commissions. Um, And then I had children and my daughter grew up. I think this was so special for her. Um, she grew up going to low mill with me the first three years of her life. And, Aww. you know, artist <laughs> friends would come and hold her and like give her little things. And then when she was old enough to walk, she could just toddle down the hallway and see all this wonderful art and, <laughs> you know, go, she, she would go down to one of my friend's clay studios and she would give her little bits of clay and then she would buy her them. It was just magical. <laughs> so, yeah. And with that, that's when I started having to switch up mediums Mm -hmm. because I love oil paint, but it was so much to clean up. I couldn't have her, you know, chugging a a jar of turpentine that she thought was water. (laughs) Um, There's cadmium in a lot of the paints, so I couldn't have her, you know, pop up pop open some cadmium paint and take a swig of that either. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So I got out and I needed to be able to set things down and just leave when I needed yes. to. Okay. Oh my I, goodness. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I switched to, I started doing these charcoal drawings where I would put charcoal powder on the surface of a gessoed hardboard panel. And then I would subtractively draw. Uh-huh. So I did those. I think I started those actually when I was pregnant with Sophie, my my oldest. And those were really magical and intimate. And then once I had her, you know, then I started thinking about the charcoal powder <laughs> and <laughs> her breathing that. So I switched over to doing watercolor. So I was doing these kind of monochromatic watercolors. Um if I have any, I think they're all, they're all hanging in the house. Instead of like family photos, we have family paintings. So I have a literal whole wall and it's oh, basically it's awesome. Sophie's babyhood. Um, the second baby kind of got, <laughs> bless his heart. There aren't as many paintings of him. If y'all have more than one child, you know why. Um, so, Definitely. <laughs> so they're mostly of her and moments where like there's one where she's laying on my husband's uh, chest and there's one where she's just standing in front of a window and it's it's a very loosely painted one but it's one of my favorites she's like reaching out and it's like kind of her shadowy silhouette and and the light coming through and then there's some of like my pregnant belly some of the charcoal ones so that's like the family wall of their basically their ba- babyhood yeah. and my maternity. So that's kind of a meditative. Oh, that's so special. That's one. Yeah. <laughs> so it's upstairs. Um, so I switched over to the watercolor. And then in, after I had my second child, I honestly went through a couple of years where I could hardly paint at all. I mean, every once in a while, I'd get out here and I'd like get a couple of brush strokes yeah. down. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I also, in that time, there was a pandemic. I had a second baby. I got my uh, pastoring license. I had worked in youth ministry in my 20s in the summers wow. and um, had a lead pastor there that talked me into painting in front of everyone during worship sessions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was the first time I thought about liturgical art. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. And he sadly passed away from a rare form of cancer, but he was just one of the most creative, inclusive ministers I had ever met or worked with. So to this day, I kind of feel like he's up there, you know, um, and and lessons he taught me Mm -hmm. about using, using art in a sacred way and in an inclusive way. So um, at, at the church, I was always kind of accidentally involving, sort of accidentally. I look back and go, no, I was doing it intentionally because I loved being involved in ministry. But I told myself, whoops, you know, I got involved in ministry again. And, and finally, I had a friend go, 
I think that you might have missed a calling. And to go backwards a little bit, when I finished my BFA degree at Ole Miss, there was a female pastor that was serving at a Methodist church um, from my hometown. And she was the subject of one of my BFA paintings. I did these little kind of intimate portraits and they were all about um, painting someone from life and being present with people, you know, and how a lot of times with like cell phones and screens, we are not yeah. present with people. So it was taking that screen out or a printed photo and painting people um, completely from life. And so wow. at the at the time I started talking to her about ministry. And so at the end of my BFA years, I was very torn between going to seminary to serve in the Methodist church as a pastor or going to art school. And at the time I chose art school because I thought, well, I can't do both of them. You know, I can't be in seminary and art school at the same time. They have not created that program yet. Maybe I will, but they, should. they totally should. Yeah. So I was <laughs> doing that. That's awesome. Yeah. And now they, now they might actually have, yeah. they have like, you know, art therapy and all these, they always come up yeah. with these things after you've graduated. It's kind of like when you have a baby and they invent all these cool baby strollers and you're like, well, mine doesn't go in a stroller anymore. You yeah. should have done that earlier. But anyway, my friend was like, I think you've missed a calling here. And then um, the senior pastor at the church, we had just become very close talking about ideas about art in the church. And um, yeah, and then she talked me into doing a sermon. And after that, it was kind of like I, I started licensing school and got licensed. And then, you know, I had a new baby as well. So that's when I was like, I really need a quick art medium. So I started doing these stipple drawings, those micron pens. Yeah, yeah. I also tried out Inktober for the first time ever. <laughs> and I look at those drawings and I'm like, they don't, they definitely don't fit like in the line of my work all the time. But it got me, I just needed something to get me drawing again. Um, because the, the year of the pandemic, when I had my second baby, um, I had an emergency with him and was put on bed rest. So I just, I wasn't painting at all. I was just, you know, kind of sitting around, laying around yeah. and there was a pandemic going on. <laughs> so I was playing a lot of Animal Crossing <laughs> with my sister <laughs> online and um, doing a lot of FaceTiming. And so I, I got some Micron pens and just got sketchbooks and just started drawing either what was in front of me or doing like prompt lists or whatever. Yeah. And um, then I did these stippled drawings for a sermon series uh -huh. with uh, one of the other pastors at our church. And I did a couple of commissions that were stippling. And I love those. I love drawing that way, but that does take a long time. And then my toddler got busy, you know, walking and potty training. So then I picked up a ballpoint pen and I kind of miss being more gestural you know, with the stippling, you really have to tighten up. And while it's impressive, I felt like it was kind of missing that breath that my more gestural work takes. So picked up that ballpoint pen and just went for it. And I uh, fell in love with like, just, you feel like you're scribbling almost. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I have one. I, I love grabbed a couple of sketchbooks. Yeah. So um, here is... Um, here's one. I don't know how else it's going to show. So this was a combination of like stippling and watercolor. And that's my husband under a blanket and my daughter sitting oh, on top. So yeah. yeah, a lot of my work is kind of about the kind of magical realism about kind of the poetry of like family life and the intimacy yeah, of family I life. That. Yeah. Yeah. And he's yeah. just to brag on him for a minute. He's an amazing dad. And um he had just had this like talk with her and um about something and then she just playfully sat on top of him because he was <laughs> tired so I felt like that was so symbolic of like you know being parents and giving and then the kids are looking to you for strength yeah. but, you know they also she was wearing like a snow white play dress and they give you strength and you give them strength yeah. so that idea of like a everything becoming a mountain or a landscape and um, and then um, I started doing some of these too. Oh, so yeah. this oh. one I made a linoleum cut out of. So you'll see this little 
things show up in a bunch of different pieces. Yeah, I think I saw that. Yeah, there's like two more pieces back here with the exact same linoleum cut, but they all look different. Yeah. But I love the way our hair seemed to just meld together. <laughs> That like, especially with my daughter, that that cycle of femininity and those sacred moments. And then here were some of the ballpoint pens like this one as my toddler started to get go. I mean, it's just a tissue box, but there was something meditative about building the line work and going oh, crazy. Yeah. And then these were like my feet, like we were all watching a movie. So I was, you know, scribbling with my pen. So I switched, and and so I've I've got this little library of sketchbooks building where oh this one yeah grab what I wish that I had some kind of I I I start drawing in sketchbooks and then they just I don't know where they go you know oh, well I mean say I have piles of them I have I have a couple at the school I have one at the church I have like five in the studio if we go yeah, on a road trip awesome. I grab one. Well, I love that you're like, so, I mean, as a mom, and I had a new baby in 2020 as well. <laughs> I had a four month old. Well, she was born in 2000, at the end of 2019. And so she was a newborn through 2020. And um, I totally understand what you're talking about. Like, and it's interesting how as mothers, as artists, we kind of adjust our practice to make room for things yeah and I think a lot of people understand that especially like like some people don't adjust and adapt they're just like well I can't I can't do that yeah. anymore but you're finding these it's it's almost like your medium and your art itself are are all combined together to kind of tell this story of you know, you're you're literally adjusting to family life and your medium is adjusting to it, too. Yeah. <laughs> and what you're drawing and what you're making. And it's kind of all like this cohesive, you know, story that you're you have of your life. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, really inspiring to other women. Too. Yeah, because you'll get cultural pressure, um, like in, in grad school. Um, no one ever said this to me, but I just got this impression that you kind of had to choose um, mm. and that you couldn't, you know, that that better. I couldn't be this like small town girl living kind of a traditional like family life or mm. or not that it has to be traditional, but I feel like that's the wrong word. I, I just felt like you traditional is a political word and yeah. I, don't, I don't mean traditional in like a political sense at all I just mean like um for me I knew I wanted to have children and you know to meet a partner that wanted to be a continuous family together yeah. and you have all these things like oh to be a good mom you know you got to play 20 sports and be at every game and like just this fear of like I've got to pick one and I can't make a life out of each where I'm fully present and I embrace them. Um, and no one ever said that, but just all the artists you would study in art history and all the, a lot of the contemporary theory classes where you go, it just seems like I have to be this outright rebel against every single thing and like, or this, you know, and I would feel kind of out of place. Although, you know, like growing up, sometimes I felt out of place in my small down, town yeah. <laughs> too, for different different reasons. And I just sometimes was like, where do my feet go? I don't feel like there's a place for me because yeah. I love this, but I also love this and I want to pick the different things. And um, so my advice would be like, you'll get a lot of different voices depending on um, how you grew up and what you want. And then kind of the historical picture and just general pressure of, of uh, getting it right. And I'll say the gift of aging is you start to loosen your hold on that. And, oh, I was listening to another podcast the other day. What did they say? Yeah, they were like this. They said the skin of something gets thinner. I can't remember what it was, but they put it beautifully. <laughs> um, it's like you're... You, you know, you're told that your skin needs to get thicker. And it's like, no, in a way, you just let it get thinner. You just let all that stuff kind of pass yeah. through. 
And you just cease to worry about it because you learn that you're not going to please everybody. You're not going to have your perfect picture, you know, and, and a lot of what you, um, grow up with. And and I had a great childhood, um, amazing parents and, and family life and everything. Um, but you know, you, you get out in the world and it's like you, it's just, a, it's a combination. What you become is this combination of all these little bitty things and experiences. And you start to decide what you want, like what's right, what's wrong, what's, you know, what works and what doesn't. And I feel like where I I am now in life, I feel much more comfortable in my own shoes than I ever did. <laughs> and I just started to give myself that permission, you know, mm-hmm. like no one's going to tell me what makes me a good or bad mom. No one's going to tell me, you know, what my art career should look like or what makes me an artist. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to tell myself that no one else. There's, there, there's just so many things that like you're saying, you know, that were we experience in somebody, it didn't necessarily mean that someone said, hey, you can't do that. That's not possible. You know, yeah. it's wrong. But you get these impressions and people kind of talk about, you know, the starving artist and then the mother who her kids are her everything. And, you know, like as a as a mom artist, my kids are my everything. But I'm also an artist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think they, they get to see other parts of you and they get to yeah, see that yeah. you are. You, you are know, your own yeah. person. You're a woman unto yourself yeah. as well as their mother. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it brings a lot of like more interesting, I don't know, experiences and conversations and things with your kids, you know, that if you had just said, you know what, I can't and put it aside, put it in the closet. They would have never known. They would have never seen you doing it. They wouldn't have the experiences at low meal. And that would have just been like, that didn't happen. And so then they wouldn't have experienced all those, you know, little moments. Yeah. Have those memories that change who they are, you know, like, yeah. are your kids interested in art and stuff? Oh yeah. They, they love to come out here. I, I can't really turn my whole laptop around, but um, they've got a little easel over there and a little table. And then they have, oh, yeah. I've got these shelves, one half, half of the shelf. They know like that half of the shelf, that's mommy's. You don't touch any of that. The other half of the shelf is all for them. So it's got like Play-Doh stamps paint and they know that that those are their things and the great part is like it's a garage and so they can fling paint on the floor yeah (laughs) you know get it everywhere and it doesn't matter and then they know not you know when they go in the house like they know if they want to do that they come out here so it gives them a space to and I know that doesn't work for every artist I have artist mother (laughs) friends that are like yeah I, I prefer to have my own space and um, but like I said, you you got to do what works for you. And I just found that for me, it, once they were big enough, making a place for them. And when they were baby, baby, I put a pack and play out here so they could just oh, you know, yeah, go to yeah. sleep. Yeah. Um, and now I would say my main mediums are I am starting to oil paint again. And to make that work, I just I. <laughs> I kind of compare it being Methodist. I compare it to Lent. That sounds really weird, but oh, I guess fun. I guess what I mean by that is it, at Lent you you give you abstain from something in order to. I like to phrase it this way. It's not a lot of people say giving up up something, but then you fall into that trap of like I'll give up chocolate and then I'll be like skinny or whatever. So I like to suggest abstaining from like a habit because it's more about you abstain from that in order to um be nurtured more so I for me I started thinking about okay I would think oh I didn't get to paint it all this week I'm so tired but then I would look back and go yeah but I stayed up really late watching Netflix laying in the bed (laughs) Which I this is where where I don't get drunk, I still do that. But I started thinking, what if like two nights a week, instead of watching the show, I went and painted because it's not stressful. It would be just, just as relaxing in my studios right out here. You know, so I'm just I guess I'm more careful with my time because I just literally I could feel it in here. I was like, I miss painting so bad. I just started to miss it so badly. 
And so I just finally told myself, well, like, what can you trade in? There's got to be something, even if you're painting 20 minutes. And I still only get to paint a couple times a week, not every day. Um, mm -hmm. But I started just trading in like maybe one night when I would be watching two hours of Netflix mm -hmm. after the kids are in bed, I go out here. And like my husband loves to play video games at night, which is great because I don't feel pressure to like, this sounds bad to hang out with him, but I love to hang he out with my husband, but interest. he's kind of introverted and he loves to play his video games. And, you know, <laughs> there are evenings where we hang out and like talk and talk and talk, but most evenings he likes to play the video games. Yeah. I can come out here and paint and that's great. Like it's perfect for us. So reminding myself, like you've got to trade in that time. Yeah. Or something that will nurture you more. And just reminding myself that it's difficult, but it's worth the trade. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, too, you know, there are a lot of people out there. I think one of my, my biggest soapboxes is people who give it up. Give up doing something that they really loved making or whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it's singing or music or whatever, yeah. writing. But when people give it up because they think that they can't because of whatever, you know, block or wall yeah. that they feel is there. So like not having enough time, I don't yeah. have enough time, I don't have enough time, but really you do. You just have to choose that. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's so okay. much about like so much of artist practice, I think is about habit and choice mm -hmm. and, if we remember that, that can be really, really helpful. And then I also like when I take my kids places like to dance or some when I take them to a place where someone else will be watching them for an hour or even 30 minutes. Sure. I always have a sketchbook and a ballpoint pen with me. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So that's how I'm making it work right now is I'm trying to get back into my oil painting because I just feel like I have to. I, I just love, love it. Love your your oil painting back there with this is like the shark. Um, oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, and that one over there is so beautiful. I love the like. I don't know if you're <laughs> finished with that one with the the lady at the bottom. Oh yeah, that one's actually that's a grad school painting. It's it's been around for a while. So I, I love that the the whole like yeah. kind of white space, although it's not white, but you know, having that that sort of design element to it too it's really beautiful yeah thank you yeah that one's called wanderer but she's wandering oh, she's got a yeah. what's wrapped around her it's a blanket that my piano teacher made for me um when I graduated so wow yeah it's like that idea of protection yeah I love that oh my gosh I think it was like when I was in grad school it was that feeling of like is there a place for me you know I don't feel like I quite fit in here but then I also don't feel like I quite fit in here. So where is yeah. my space? Oh, that's wonderful. So um, do you have your art? Do you have a studio at Low Mill or do you have don't a anymore. It just, or anything that you you're involved in with your art? Yeah. So my studio is we we have a two car garage that we've never used for our cars. And <laughs> it was all my studio and then pandemic hit. So there's a little engineer corner over there where my husband <laughs> uh, mostly works from home, like a lot of suddenly customers. appeared. <laughs> yeah. So I had to give him a corner. But the rest of it is is still my studio space. Um, I love I will always love what Low Mill gave me, but it got really hard. I think the turning point was I was trying to kind of sleep train my daughter oh. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we know how that goes. And the walls of the studios at Low Mill don't go all the way up. So that didn't really work out. And yeah. I just, that wasn't the <laughs> only people thing, like banging was, and that was a key noise. moment where I was like, this <laughs> is really disruptive. And there's it's a community space. And um, yeah. And then just. You know, once she became a toddler, the the building isn't as comfortably designed. And at the time we didn't have that I moved out. We also we only had part time daycare um, and it just wasn't like yeah. the comfiest space for a kid to be that on the move. So, yeah. 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 So I was like, I need a space where like she can have a set play area and and also just the hours. Um, understandably, 
you know, when you're in a community space that's public, mm-hmm. uh, you do need to be there a certain amount of time because people visit. And if there are never any artists in their studios, well, <laughs> you know, it is partially it's called arts and entertainment. So it is a space for the public as well as for the private. So, you know, I just needed more of a private space for myself in yeah. a place where I didn't have any commitment to someone's exterior um, hours. So, yeah. And so this, I can walk out here in my pajamas with coffee at five o'clock in the morning. If that's the only way to get to work on anything yeah. or after the kids are in bed, I can, once again, I, I like to come out here in my pajamas normally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It gave me that flexibility. Awesome. Um, and then as far as current projects, I literally, when, when this podcast co- opportunity came up, um, Kimberly Hart is a friend of mine. I think she's interviewing later today. Next. Yeah. <laughs> And she and I have been friends for years and I just, I treasure her and her friendship so much. Uh, she's also a very multimedia artist. I, I think even more than me, I'm, I'm always like, I'm amazed. Like you could take a leaf off the ground and like add like thread and just make it this beautiful work <laughs> of art. She's so imaginative and humble. And um, so she and I started talking Well, we've talked for years, but I just had this kind of nudge. I was thinking about her work and the work she's been doing, especially lately. And I thought, you know, I feel like there's this thread that runs through both of our work about the feminine divine. Mm -hmm. And what I love about it, too, is is her kind of spirituality um, is is doesn't happen, you know, under a a set uh, church. um, For sure religion the way that mine does Mm -hmm. and what I love about that contrast is that I think it's it shares this kind of universal sacred divine Mm -hmm. um in our work that's that's particular to the feminine Mm -hmm. and so I thought you know it kind of scares me I really want to do a show but I haven't done a show in years like a fully fledged show and at least I think it's been at least two years, maybe even three. I think if my, since I have my second son and he, second son, sorry, I don't have a second son, a second child, and he just turned three. So um, it sounds a lot more comfortable for me to share a show with someone. So we were like, what if we did like a duet, you know, a two person show? Yeah. Yeah, We're not sure where we're going to do it. Our plan is to write a proposal and probably send it to several galleries instead of just one. Um, probably a smaller, more intimate space because that fits the the feel of our work. And our work is very intimate um, and kind of soft and layered. Oh, and okay. so, yeah, so we're in the process. And we also came up with this idea. We were like, I started thinking my children get play dates. Why don't adult artists get play dates? We deserve this. <laughs> so... <laughs> And we actually needed it to be kind of spontaneous, though, and not a set day. (laughs) So we just decided, hey, with no set agenda, let's just when we feel the nudge, let's make our work individually. But let's just every once in a while say time for an artist date and whatever we can grab, let's do it. So a few times this summer, she would go to my house and or I would go to hers and we would just chat and work on our work together. Um, oh, so it's yeah. it's low pressure. Yeah. <laughs> then some other artists caught wind of it and we invited them as well. And then I was like, you know what? I'm a part of Alabama Women's Caucus for the Arts. I just rejoined it, in fact. So I rejoined that yeah. in the hopes that it will kind of push me forward to get back into my kind of the professional side of being a working artist. And um, so we opened the invitation to them and I'll open it on this podcast. We like to have artist play dates. So if you want to join us, yeah. it's just whoever can come and we make, you know, little charcuterie boards and drink coffee oh, and we work on our, our artwork and, and it's a real treat. Um, so we're going to do that. Our, our only thing that we said, we said, let's do this for about a year, gather the work we have. Uh, work on a proposal. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm also entering individual pieces and shows because, you know, that's real low pressure as well. Um, Yeah. And and for me, I'm my process right now, as far as the series, there's not really one singular set idea. Um, I do see in a lot of my work, whether it's a portrait or still life, this is one thing I admittedly 
kind of wrote down because I was like, I don't know. Um, I wrote down exploration of the genuine divine. Mm, okay. Yeah. So like, <laughs> <laughs> so looking at like the poetry of color, whether it's a portrait or like a, mm. I like to gather a lot of like a flower or I'm really good at not keeping flowers alive. So like if my if my husband gives me flowers or I buy myself flowers, I'll let them dry out. And I love painting like dried flowers. Uh, the texture of dried flowers is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I love painting dried flowers. Um, Sophie sat up a little still life for me the other day with like she made these little shapes out of Play-Doh and stuck flowers from the yard in it. So oh. I let her set it up in like my official still life spot. I have a little um thing made of two panels so um I might paint that who knows that's fun. and then yeah and then I'll you know my children all the time I love pictures of them sleeping yeah. like little <laughs> dancers when they sleep and their hair is all spread out and you know I call it genuine divine so I'm like it's not something I can make up but there's just something so like tender and beyond yeah what I can put into words with moments like that yeah so that's what I'm working on right now. That's awesome. Well, how can people connect with you and find your art? They can. Well, um, they can find me on Instagram at a moon, all one word, underscore artist. And then my website, I have not updated it in a long time. But um, my sister made it. She's a graphic designer, so um, it'll it'll it will show a good spread of my different kinds of work. So that's AinsleyMoonArtist.com. dot com, mm-hmm. and then on Facebook, Ainsley Moon Artist is my artist page. So the most up to date things are always going to be on the the Instagram. It's kind of like a working, you know, just visual yeah. constant. I call it a record rather than a website looks great. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. It looks like you've been keeping it up. I don't know. That's that's my, that's my sister. So (laughs) yeah, that's always one of those things. I think a lot of artists have trouble doing is like, there's a website out there or an Etsy or something. Well, I'm spoiled. My sister got her degree in, um, in design, got her BFA in graphic design. So yeah that's nice (laughs) so yeah oh thank you so much for talking to me today and um I love your work I love it absolutely and the way that you're just you know adapting your life and getting it in there and doing it still is awesome Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Art Talk with April. For more information on this episode, join the Facebook group, The Art Lounge. Please subscribe and share. See you next Tuesday. Hope you have a great week.